Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is a great sight line. I just want to tell you, standing up here and looking out at all of you, this idea that we had about how this was going to work, two levels, people up, people down, this is, I think this is what we were hoping to accomplish. So on behalf of the McBurney Center and the Division of Student Life, thank you very much for coming and welcome to the dedication celebration of the McBurney Disability Resource Center in our new home at 702 West Johnson. Um, thank you all for making time in your very busy schedules to come and celebrate this event with us this evening. Um, to begin, just to say there have been many, many moving parts in getting this event organized and planned. And as you might imagine, it took a real team effort. I want to begin the evening by thanking the members of the team at UW Foundation who were really pivotal in pulling this all off for us and, and making it work smoothly, particularly recognizing Danny Luckett and Kate Barr in the back who were the point, point people at the foundation and have, helping us with this evening. And I think they did a great job, so let's recognize them. I'm not great at doing head counts, but I'm going to guess we have 70, 80 people with us this evening um, here in this space to be part of this celebration. And we're here really to do a couple of things. We're here to celebrate the new space. We're here to thank the many individuals over the years who have made contributions to our program. We'd like to honor our founders. We'd like to dedicate the James Grass Camp Conference Room and establish the Grass Camp Scholarship for Students with Disabilities um, on our campus beginning this year. We are also pleased to offer this celebration to many of our friends and colleagues who are not able to be with us in the space tonight, but are joining us via a live web uplink um, being hosted on our website. And the screen that you see to the left, to, to my right, I think to your left, um, in addition to the visuals, will be what is shown on the web tonight. So I'm not quite sure how many of our guests are with us virtually in the, in the, the web community, but I do want to acknowledge a couple of people that I do know are with us this evening. Nancy Smith, the first director of the McBurney Disability Resource Center, is joining us from Newcastle, Indiana. Um, Nancy, wherever you are, I hope you're hearing this and the feed is working for you. Nancy was the first director and she was here at the McBurney Center from 1981 to 1988. Trey Duffy, who is currently the director of disability services at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, is also joining us via the web. I spoke with him today. I confirmed that he didn't have jury duty and that he would be able to be with us this evening and he assured me that it was in his calendar. Um, Trey was the director here at the center from 1989 to 2005. I believe in the audience tonight we also have two women who were our interim directors, Pat DeNoyer, who was the interim director from 1988 to 89, and B.A. Squeers, who led the program from 2005 to 2006. These four leaders were really instrumental in bringing our program from a very small two, three, four-person shop to the organization we are today, which employs 14 staff, 16 to 18 students, and several hourly and academic staff members who work for us on a part-time basis. It's really their passion and their vision and their leadership that has made the McBurney Center a national leader in post-secondary disability services. And I'd like to honor the, the folks that came before me in the directorship. We are also here to mark the unwavering commitment that the University of Wisconsin-Madison has made to students with disabilities really since just after World War II when returning vets were coming to campus, vets with disabilities, who were coming here expecting to receive and did receive the world-class education that our campus is known for. UW's commitment to individuals with disabilities really precedes any legislative directive to make this campus accessible. Our campus's approach which is reflected in the vision of our founders, has always been one of creating opportunity. Three of our speakers tonight are Badgers, whose stories will illustrate not only the benefit of this vision, but also the power for change that is at the core of the Wisconsin idea. I would like to begin by introducing Provost Paul DeLuca, who will be providing our opening remarks. After completing a doctoral degree in nuclear physics at Notre Dame, the provost joined our campus community in 1971 as a faculty member in the departments of radiology, medical physics, human ecology, engineering physics, and physics. 
He served in associate and vice dean positions in the School of Medicine and Public Health, and was appointed our provost in 2009. Now, I had the opportunity to introduce myself to the provost at the diversity forum this past fall. Ran into him in the hallway and thanked him, introduced myself and thanked him for his support for the building of, of this facility that we're in this evening. And he looked at me and he kind of chuckled and he said, well, you really pulled that rabbit out of a hat. And I thought, ooh, I don't know what that means, but I know enough if the provost says something like that to you, you don't ask any questions. But you do invite him to give your opening remarks. Provost Fluger. <laughs> Kathy's very polite. Uh, there was a certain amount of rabbit pulling that took place. There's no question about it. Uh, but it's really a great opportunity for me to be here. But I think the point of all of this is it's an opportunity for our students that they heretofore would not have. Uh, it's very tough to create this kind of space. Um, it doesn't quite fit anything but it is essential to the fabric of our existence to be able to provide this kind of facility. Uh, it's just spectacular to be here. The rabbit hat part was there were a range of possibilities, but there was really only one logical possibility, and that's the one we're standing in. Uh, so somehow we had to arrange the, the conversation in such a fashion that everyone followed that same logic tree, and we were successful. And I, I think it's a tribute to the services that are provided. The impact that has on our campus uh, is quite spectacular. I've seen it over the years in the medical school where it's quite important. But you know where it really uh, struck me as, as unusual is we've been working very hard on developing new ways to manage traumatic brain injury. And, and unfortunately, traumatic brain injury as a result of the conflict in Afghanistan uh, has gone up dramatically. And I was out at Walter Reed, and I was looking at these young people and the, you know, the unfortunate disabilities that they've encountered. And the abilities that they have to participate are going up dramatically. And our ability to help them in any way we can is wonderful. But in any case, on a somewhat more amusing note, when I was preparing for this, uh, I had forgotten that the original location of the McBurney Center was actually in the old Park Street bank, right? And it was in really bizarre quarters in that bank. And I remember this very clearly because my dentist was on the next floor. And I would walk by this every day. I was going to see the dentist for whatever reason. I was like, you got to be kidding me. That can't be where it is, right? Well, you know, 30, 40 years later, I find out, in fact, where it is, all right? So it was really impressive. And I think Blair Matthews is here with his wife. Is Blair around? Let's, I, I think Blair was seminal to this uh, effort. Maybe a round of applause for his efforts on that. Pardon me? Ah, thanks. So let me, uh, let me not bore you with too much conversation. As you can tell, I'm older than dirt. I've done all the jobs that exist. Uh, but this is one of the few jobs and few activities that I really enjoy participating in. Uh, I, I think this must be particularly satisfying to the people who work here and particularly satisfying to the foundation. Uh, I saw Marion earlier. I'm sure the foundation uh, enjoys this kind of activity almost much more than anything else they do. So I hope to meet more of you as the evening goes on. I hope you have a chance to visit all the facility. There's plenty of space upstairs and downstairs, and I understand there's even wine. So thank you so much, Kathy. Thank you, Provost. Bobby Cordano has a list of accomplishments on the back of the program. And I'm here to tell you that that is an abbreviated list. In addition to serving as the prosecutor for the Minnesota Attorney General's Office, Director of Disability Services at the University of Minnesota, Assistant Dean at the University of Minnesota Hubert Humphrey Institute of Public Policy, President of Park Nicolay Institute, Interim President of the Center for Healthcare Innovations at Alina Health Systems. That's all in her past, of course. Her current role as Vice President of Programs at Amherst H. Wilder Foundation. In addition to all of the above, Bobby has also been, or also is, one of the founding members of Metro Deaf School, a pre-K-8 
bilingual charter school for deaf and hard of hearing students in St. Paul, Minnesota, and a founding board member of Minnesota North Star Academy, which is a bilingual bicultural charter high school also in the Twin Cities that opened in 2004. Bobby is the 2003 recipient of the inaugural Hubert H. Humphrey Institute Public Leadership Award, sharing that recognition with Vi uh, former Vice President Walter Mondale and Paku Hung, a leader in the Hmong community in the Twin Cities. Now that list of accomplishments would be enough to bring Bobby to our campus this evening, but that's not why she's here. Bobby came to our campus in 1987 as one of the first deaf law students to attend our law school. And she shook things up around here just a little bit. UW was really not prepared to deliver services to a deaf law student. And quite honestly, we weren't entirely sure that we needed to. But Bobby did the thing that we really want all students to do. She practiced effective self-advocacy. And when you are on the receiving end of effective self-advocacy from someone like Bobby Cordano, you pay attention and you make the changes you need to make. And I'm pleased to say that the interpreter that worked with Bobby is now at UW-Milwaukee, but that was one part-time person in 87. And our staff to serve students who are deaf or hard of hearing today is five. And that's just the staff here at McBurney. We also work with hourly interpreters and captions to deliver services when we need to deliver them, how we need to deliver them, and in the best possible way so that students can go on and have the opportunities and take advantage of their education in the way that Bobby has. I couldn't be more delighted to bring you back to campus, Bobby. Welcome back, and please come speak with us. I would not have given you that hug after the first semester <laughs> anyway, but I am delighted to be back. Um, and uh, thank you for your kind words and the nice welcome, Provo. Um, wow, this is impressive. Uh, I have this as a line in the end of the speech, and I think I have to say it now. This is the new gold standard. I am so pleased and so impressed for the University of Wisconsin the McBurney Disability Resource Center, and I really am proud to call myself an alum and to tell people this is where you need to come. One thing that I don't, uh, if you look around, um, and even with how this event is being conducted tonight, there, is, there are elements of universal design everywhere you turn. And for those of you who don't know what universal design is, this is a concept that was first coined by Ron Mays at the University of North Carolina, and it's defined as the, um, of course, 21 years later, reading glasses, the concept of designing all products and the built environment to be aesthetic and usable to the greatest extent possible by everyone, regardless of their age, ability, or status in life. Higher education has actually led the movement of adopting principles of universal design into teaching, service delivery, program design, as well as building more inclusive and welcoming communities for student, faculty, and staff. And if you look around here, I actually see, and when I was at uh, Disability Services at the University of um, Minnesota, we did a lot of work there. Um, and I am seeing a beautiful integration of probably about 10 years of work related to universal design. And it's wonderful to see, and I think you can expect to see a lot of people from, this from all over the country and the world coming to see this office. The other thing that I noticed that I think is important compared to 21 years ago, if you think about the bank, um, this is strategically located in the heart of, the, of the, this campus. Um, the whole concept of when you are welcome here as a student, you are welcome here to, to, to state all of your needs as a student, which is not something that necessarily happened 21 years ago. Um, and I think that Mike McBurney, James Grafkamp, would be thrilled to see this center today. And I just met Mike McBurney's sister, and she affirmed that. Um, John Hockenberry, who is a journalist for NPR, who also has a physical disability, so I'm sure many of you have heard him on NPR, wrote a wonderful article for Wired Magazine in 2001 titled The New Brainiacs. In that article, he says, and I quote, when you think disability, think zeitgeist. I'm serious. 
We live at a time when the disabled are on the leading edge of a broader societal trend of, of the, toward the use of assistive technology. With the advent of miniature wireless tech, and keep in mind, this was written in 2001. I'm not even sure iPod were out, much less the iPad, which is my new favorite toy. Electronic gadgets have stepped up their invasion of the body, and our concept of what it means and even looks like to be human is wide open to debate. Humanity specs are back on the drawing board. And thanks to some unlikely designer, um, oh, th thanks to some unlikely designer, and the disabled have a serious advantage in this conversation. They have been using technology in collaborative, intimate ways for years to move, to communicate, to interact with the world. And one example of this is what you're watching right now, that there is a, a webcast with captioning happening all at once around the community who wants to participate with this event tonight. When I was a, when I was a student here at the University of um, Wisconsin-Madison, I was one of the first deaf graduate students, as Kathy explained. And I should say, I wasn't one of the first, I wasn't the first deaf student. There was actually a man before me who was deaf, but he was oral. And so he didn't use sign language interpreters. The distinction is that I was one of the first sign, deaf students who used sign language interpreters as an accommodation. Um, the result of being a first is that you end up testing a system capacity to respond. At the time, the McBurney Disability Resource Center had very little infrastructure to support the capacity of a deaf student in a demanding and rigorous graduate school program. This changed a lot during the three years that I was here, but not without struggle from me, the interpreters that worked with me, and even the staff in the McBurney Resource Center, who also tried to advocate to strengthen its capacity to serve a student like me. But one of my life lessons that I've drawn from that experience is that it is healthy to have outliers creating tension for an organization, especially one at large at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And by the way, I'm not sure I'm using this term in the way that Malcolm Gladwell in his recent book, Outliers, I was just looking at that, and I think my definition is a little bit different. I'm really talking about if you've got a mainstream uh, profile of a student or a faculty or staff person, is that the outlier that those, uh, is an individual who's outside that mainstream vision or profile. Anyway, outliers are rarely alone. And in fact, um, one of my highlights in my law school experience, and I'm sorry Cliff Thompson isn't here, he was the interim dean when I was there, um, was when a cadre of my peers, and I think it was more than 20, um, got together after they had heard that McBurney had turned down a request that I had made for an event um, because I had not made the request within 24 hours, which was a minimum, and it was a legal standard. And these students went to the dean and said, well, but Bobby didn't know about it and with more than 24 hours, so how could that be? And they marched into the dean's office and said, get her an interpreter. To be honest, I don't even remember if there was an interpreter in the event. What I remember was that event of my students and my peers showing up. And that was the first time that I understood that access could be a movement. This significantly informed my leadership and has over the years. I take care in my daily life to find and recognize the outliers in the community and the organizations in which I serve. I believe that outliers push communities and organizations to be better than they are sometimes prepared to be or want to be. And when we embrace the challenge they raise, the result is almost always better for everyone. But the challenge is usually convincing people um, who are not the outliers um, that is, uh, I'm sorry, but the challenge of convincing people to change and respond to the, um, the opportunity is actually more difficult than, the, um, than what is being asked of us. And so I have found that the real trick in leadership is to try to figure out how to guide people to respond to the call created by outliers. And in the end, when we're all able to pull together to creatively find solutions, we all feel and find ourselves better off for having done that. And I strongly believe, especially after arriving here, Kathy explained to me all the changes, but I have to tell you, I am, this is breathtaking. Um, 
and I wrote these words, and they have even a stronger meaning for me um, than when I actually wrote them, and that is that this opening symbolizes a new era of creating a stronger and more inclusive community at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Congratulations. One of our program values here at the center is to provide opportunities for employment for students with disabilities. And I have to tell you, this is one of the smartest values that we could hold because of the quality of the students that we do get working for us at the center. Megan Minster has been a disability program aide since she was a freshman. And this past year, she was promoted to supervisor of our student front desk operations staff running the face, really, of the McBurney Center because it's the students at the front desk that meet and greet the students that come in the door, speak to faculty and staff on the phone, talk to parents, talk to the community members. They are the face of our center, and it is a critical and vitally important job. The person who is in charge of that, which is Megan for us, really sets the tone for the welcome that any guest that comes to the McBurney Center will receive. In addition to being a terrific member of our team, Megan is a junior in her program, recently admitted to the um, School of Social Work. She finds time to volunteer in her community. She's traveled internationally to Ireland with part of the Milwaukee Ulster Project. And she's just all around an upbeat, positive, wonderful member of our McBurney team. We couldn't be happier to have her with us. I'm telling you right now, Megan, that I'm expecting you to get your master's as well so that we can hold on to you for as many years as possible. Megan Minster. Hi, everyone. Like Kathy said, I'm Megan, and I'm a junior studying social work here. I grew up in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, and my whole life I've wanted to come here to be a badger. I started Irish dancing when I was four years old, and I com continued competing and performing across the country until my junior year of high school when I was diagnosed with a connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome that causes my joints to dislocate extremely easily. This diagnosis was very challenging for me to deal with because it meant immediately giving up my life as a dancer, and less than a year later, I became wheelchair dependent. While I'm still able to stand and walk short distances, using a wheelchair on campus is really helpful to prevent pain and um, preserve the quality of my joints for as long as I can. I have always loved Madison, and my senior year of high school, when I was looking at colleges to apply to, I knew UW was the only place I wanted to come. I was very nervous about moving to campus because I was so new to being a wheelchair user and I had no idea how getting around on a campus this big would work out for me. During my summer orientation, I met with my accommodation specialist here at McBurney for the first time and I felt so much more comfortable after that and was really ready for my transition to campus. My freshman year here was a huge transition for me, both academically and in terms of my disability, but the McBurney Center has provided so much support throughout the past three years, and it's just been amazing. The support the McBurney Center has provided me has been so important to my success here as an undergraduate, both as a client and student worker. The center has played a big role in my life, and I'm so grateful for everything with which the organization has provided me. Having support from the McBurney staff in both my academics and personal life has been so beneficial to my success on campus. My lovely coworkers and the McBurney Center as a whole have been key to my growth as a student and the progress I've made during my time here. McBurney scholarships have really helped my family cover the cost of tuition and books. Out of the five kids in my family, four of us will be in college during the next academic year which puts a huge financial strain on my family. And the scholarships I've received here have really helped lessen that burden and ease some of the stress that that brings. In addition to the scholarships, my part-time job here at the McBurney Center has really helped cover just the day-to-day -day costs of being a college student. Working here for the past three years has been a wonderful experience, and I really could not ask for a better job as a student worker. 
When I found out our office was moving to this new location, I was so excited because I knew it would provide us with a way to create a new and accessible office setting. Working in this gorgeous new space has been a delight. Seemingly minor things like how the doors open or the height of the file cabinets were all carefully planned and they make a huge difference in the day-to-day -day work here at McBurney. Knowing that I can come here and not have to worry about how accessible things are going to be or if I'll be able to even get here is so nice and it really makes my life a lot easier and it definitely creates a safe and comfortable state space for students on campus with disabilities regardless of what their disability is. The support that all of you are providing to the McBurney Center is so valuable in the day-to-day -day lives of students with disabilities here on campus. Living with a disability can be very challenging for students and the McBurney Center really helps alleviate some of the extra stress that's put on us and helps, helps us work through the challenges that we face as students with disabilities. Even though my disability has changed my life in ways I never could have expected, I haven't let it stop me from fully engaging in life and really living as a badger. Working towards my goal of becoming a social worker is something I love and the McBurney Center has really played a vital role in helping me achieve this goal. So thank you guys for everything you're doing to support the McBurney Center and students with disabilities. So it sounds like we might have you through your masters. Hopefully. Okay, good. That'd be great. Um, we serve over 900 students right now on our campus, and that's probably a small percentage of students registered with our office. Um, and I have to tell you, so many of them are as wonderful as Megan. It's a privilege to work with these students. Our center, as you may or may not know, was actually founded in the memory of a student, a badger, named Mike McBurney. Mike was a local young man from Madison who sustained a cervical spinal cord injury in high school, and that was in the 1950s. Mike survived the injury, but was left with quadriplegia and faced a future that contained significant physical and social barriers that were reflective of the times. Mike was blessed with parents, siblings, and friends who never doubted his ability despite the severity of his disabilities and had the energy and the determination to assist him in reaching his life's ambition. Mike was also blessed with a formidable intelligence, a charismatic personality, and a spirit of determination that equaled, if not exceeded, that of his family and friends. Mike enrolled at UW-Madison a year after his injury. He was pushed and pulled up Bascom Hill. He was bumped down flights of stairs. He was carried in and out of campus buildings on his way to graduating Phi Beta Kappa in 1960. Continuing on to, learn his, to earn his law degree at UW, Mike graduated third in his class and practiced law with his father, Floyd, for three years before running for and being elected Dane County District Attorney in 1966. Now, it would be easy to imagine Mike's life would continue on with one achievement after another following him into the future, but that was not to be. Mike died shortly after taking office in 1967, and the dreams and the ambitions he held were cut short. Mike's sister Georgiana McBurney Stednitz and her husband Gary are with us this evening, somewhere. I know I saw them earlier. Oh, I see a hand back there. And Georgie tells a wonderful story about how she brought these two men together. Georgie spotted Grass Camp, Jim Grass Camp, in Library Mall. Jim himself, a formidable man in an extra large wheelchair with a charismatic personality and a formidable intelligence. And she thought to herself, this is someone my brother should meet. Now, Grass Camp, by that time, was a faculty member in the School of Business. He took this young undergraduate student under his wing. He gave him multiple reasons to leave the house, to enjoy it, the full experience, academic and social, he restored his confidence, and he became a lifelong friend. When Mike died, Grass Camp approached the family with the idea to use the contributions that had been made in the name of Mike's, uh, made in his memory, to start a formal disability services office. 
working with Dean of Students Paul Ginsberg and Assistant Dean of Students Blair Matthews, who is also with us this evening. The McBurney Center was founded in 1977. A gifted teacher, mentor, and visionary, Jim Grasscamp is credited with creating a vision of real estate education and elevating it to a legitimate and distinct place in academia. Recognized by the Urban Land Institute in 2006 as one of 10 real estate legends, Grasscamp was described as an exceptional leader with the capacity to make a lasting, profound difference, to take risks in pursuit of excellence, and whose perseverance ultimately results in better buildings, better neighborhoods, and better communities. Grasscamp understood on a personal as well as a theoretical level that the best communities are created when everyone in the community is included. That is his legacy here with regard to campus access and the inclusion of students with disabilities in the campus community. Now this project of putting together the McBurney Center has had many magical moments. But the story I want to share with you this evening is embedded in our desire to honor Grass Camp in naming our conference room after him. Now this project was a public-private partnership between EMI, Executive Management Incorporated, and the campus. EMI built the space and then turned it over to the campus after the renovations were completed and we were able to move in. Now I approached Doug Rose, who is here also, or was here this evening. Doug was our campus point person on the project and a terrific partner along with Doug Sabaki in realizing the vision of, of the space that you see before you. And I asked Doug, what do we need to do? What channels do we need to go through? How many committees do we need to form in order to name this conference room in honor of Jim Grasscamp? And Doug said, well, why don't you write a letter and tell me what you want to do and why, and I'll move it through the campus channels, and then I'll approach EMI with the idea. Well, the magic happened when we learned that the CEO and managing partner of EMI, Greg Rice, who was present at endless, countless planning and design meetings for the McBurney Center, was an alum of Jim Grass Camp. And I have to tell you, that just made it feel like this project came full circle for us. That the man who was founding our program back in the 60s was instrumental in pulling together the people and the resources and the voice that was needed to create our center when it was created had one of his students be part of the new and permanent home for our program. I was really struck by this and the fact that I feel that in some level we're really being watched over from, by many very benevolent guardian angels. I'm so happy to have Greg here with us tonight to speak with you, to remember the chief, and to talk about his involvement in our program. Greg Rice. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here tonight. Uh, Remembering the chief, I had the opportunity to go upstairs and uh, read the plaque that was put in the conference room that's named in his honor, and it brought back many fond memories looking at the chief in, uh, in his modus, in the mode that he moved around campus, his very large wheelchair, and remembering how he fondly talked about the old university square, the project that was here before this new beautiful building was built. He loved the old University Square. He loved how it was located, the synergies that brought the campus together with the, uh, the city of Madison. As I talked with Kathy, I think that that's one of the very interesting stories that we have here tonight is McBurney Center being located in a new University Square at the corner of Lake Street and Johnson Street with a conference room named after the chief. I think that he's somewhere looking down on us, smiling very broadly, thinking about that wonderful, wonderful thing that's happened for us all here. And the fact that uh, he was instrumental in starting the McBurney Center and that it ends up in a location that I think was very true and close to his heart many years ago. Uh, it's always, it's also interesting that uh, he and my father, Gordon, who's here tonight, uh, were very, very close friends. 
and that uh, they spent many evenings talking about real estate, reminiscing about many stories. And as Kathy said, he was a wonderful professor, both on a very theoretical level and a very practical level. And having been involved in a number of those discussions over the dinner table, it was always extremely entertaining. You didn't even think about him having any disability when you sat visiting with him. And as a student, and really representing a number of students that have had him over the years, we never thought about his having a disability. We just, he was the chief. He was our chief. He led the program. We all loved him. We would do anything for him. We went anywhere with him. If there was a way to get the trash out of the building, we knew that there was a way to get the chief into the building. That's what he said, and that's how we handled it over the years. There were a number of times he'd look up and he'd say, a lot of steps going up into the front of that building. Let's go around back and see if we can figure out how to get me in. Those are some of the memories that I have for him. I am very, very proud to have been part of, part of this wonderful project of moving the McBurney Center into this great location. Thank you all for coming, and I can truly say that it was a very, very wonderful experience. Even through all of the meetings, Kathy and her staff were wonderful people to work with. The university staff that we worked with, Doug Rose, Doug Sabaki, the other, the other people at the university campus were wonderful to work with. It culminated in just a great, great project, and I'm just very happy to have been part of it. Thank you. When I travel and talk to my counterparts across the country, one of the questions I get asked more, most often is, how did you do that? How did you get your campus to send interpreters with a deaf student to a study abroad program in China? How did you get your faculty to agree to have test accommodations provided in the department? How did you get to have a pre-doctoral psychology training site established at the center? And, and how are you doing this adaptive technology thing? And I have to tell you, the answer that I give most often is we're really lucky. And it's not the sit around and wait until good things happen kind of luck. It's the kind of luck that happens when you have the right people around the right tables at the right time who are committed to doing the right thing. There are four people I want to recognize this evening before we close because they're the people that I consider my North Stars when we are looking to advance the opportunities for students with disabilities. Ken Frazier, our general librarian and chair of the Accessibility and Usability Committee on campus, is one of the most solution-focused leaders I have ever worked with. Ken does not allow our committee to sit and say what doesn't work. He is focusing us on what would work, how do we do it, and let's get there. Ken is passionate about access, and he commits time, energy, and funds toward that end. Our Director of Legal Services and ADA Coordinator, Lisa Rutherford, is another campus treasure. Lisa has never positioned our campus to let legal compliance be the most we can do. The law provides a framework for what we must do, and Lisa provides the leadership for what we should do. In this regard, she doesn't just protect our campus reputation, she elevates it. I know our Dean of Students, Lori Berkwam, has been in many senior leadership meetings where she has been the voice for students with disabilities. Lori lives her values, and her value is social justice. In so many ways, this facility represents her commitment to this ideal. Through the long history of this program, campus leaders have stepped up to voice their concerns, their commitments, their aspirations for including students with disabilities in the fabric of campus life. We would not be here if it were not for those voices. But we all know that talk is just talk unless it is backed by action. And action requires money. The Vice Chancellor for Administration, Daryl Bazell, is the action behind that commitment. When I first came to campus as the director, our program had a fairly significant budget deficit, at least 
by my standards, it was fairly significant. I don't know that it would count as fairly significant in today's budget times, but I thought it was a pretty big deal, and I thought it might be a good idea for, my, for me to introduce myself to the Vice Chancellor so he could put a name and a face together with that budget problem. And so I met with him, and we spent a little bit of time talking about the budget. But Daryl pretty quickly turned that conversation to our temporary home on Linden Drive, which he knew was not an appropriate spot for our program. And he asked me, where do you think your program should be? Where on campus would the McBurney Center best fit? And I said to him, it should be where students go, where students are, where students will want to walk in that door. It needs to be in the heart of campus. And look where we ended up five years later. Daryl, Lori, Lisa, and Ken have made real the meaning of the Wisconsin experience for students with disabilities. On their behalf, I would like to recognize them and thank them. And to the provost, and I hope you carry this message back to the chancellor, there's just one request I have of you. Don't ever let them leave. Keep them here. My parents who are here with us this evening have instilled in me and my sister and my brothers the importance of education and an understanding that education leads to opportunity. Our program tonight illustrates how education leads, uh, does create opportunity for students from all walks of life to become catalysts for change in their community, in their state, and even on a global level. We celebrate this beautiful, accessible, and welcoming new space for the McBurney Center while we also acknowledge that our greatest satisfaction comes from this privilege of being able to walk part of the journey with these remarkable young people as they travel their pathway of learning at this institution. We thank you for your contributions and your support thus far, and we invite you to continue the journey with us. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I hope you will enjoy the refreshments, including the wine and the snacks. Enjoy the tour, and thank you again for celebrating with us this evening. Good night.